Greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Greetings. Thank you. You know, I, I, can I share something with you? When you guys were singing, uh, those of you who know me know that I cannot sing. I cannot keep a tune. I'm tone deaf. And, uh, <laughs> um, but this is my prayer while you were singing that I want to sing with you all in heaven. Because I know in heaven I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing better than my wife. But I don't want that anybody here not be there. That has been our prayer. Like yesterday, like I said, there are a group of us who are praying for you guys. And, and my heart is to remind you again and again that we love you. We see you as ones who we want to spend our eternity with, along with Christ, too. And so I pray that what we have today to share and to ask and to talk would not be uh, just forgotten. It would be taken to your heart that you would please listen to the, to the Spirit of God as He speaks to you. Uh, we also want to do at the end, we'll call up some people who we want to hold as mentors for you as, or as ones who you can reach out to either during the conference or, or after that. Take their emails, take their uh, phone numbers and, and, and talk to them. But please, I want to beg you in the name of the Lord that, uh, that, what, that you're here, not out, out of coincidence, but I believe that the Spirit will speak to you and be attentive. Right? Having said that, what did we look at yesterday? What book did we look at? Ephesians, all right, Ephesians, the first half, the second half. The first half, what was the title? Do you remember what the title was? What, what, were you, what did we say we are? Saints, saints. And we said we, we are saints and we want to be faithful saints. And today we want to look at that second part. How are we going to be faithful saints? You know, we also looked at that phrase, in him. It's in him. It's in him. It's because of Christ, not because of anything else. It's only in Christ that we have all this. you agree with that? All right? And that we are blessed. Tell me, are we blessed or are we lucky? Not lucky? All right. Okay. I, um, I must share with you a very embarrassing moment, my most embarrassing moment in Sunday school. I'm not sure if anybody blogs here and is, has got a mostembarrassingmoments.com blog or whatever it is, but here's one for you. I must have been about 12 years old or something like that, and the first time I'm reading Isaiah 14, and I get to this, and thou, O lucky for, have been cast down from heaven. And my Sunday school teacher stops me, and he says, he wasn't lucky for, he he's, he's wasn't lucky, he was Lucifer. But, um, but I... I <laughs> I, I know how the Sunday school kids, I still, you know, I'm scarred for life as a result. All right, okay. But we are, we are blessed. We are, we are blessed in him. And we see that blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with, with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Blessed be the God who has blessed us. Because he has blessed us, we can bless in return. Like, wow, really? You can bless the God of heaven. Uh, that's, that's what we wanted to touch. So we saw the Trinity being involved in what, uh, in this blessing. What, what, what do we find in the Father? God the Father gave us what? Those of you who were not here, please answer. <laughs> All right. Now, what did we get in the Father? Do you remember? Identity, identity. One thing, like the one thing that we strive for, we want to know the question that people ask, who am I? Who am I? Every teenager goes through that, trying to understand, who am I? And, and the Bible starts right at the beginning with the Father saying, even before the foundations of the world were laid, the one thing that he wants to give you is this identity, that you are going to be a holy and a blameless son and daughter of God before him. What do we have in the Son? Inheritance. We have Him. We have Him as our inheritance, right? Uh, 
you know, you probably don't have land, you don't have much money in your bank account, but who cares? I got the king of kings as my inheritance. What about the Holy Spirit? Insurance. The fact that he's given to us as an earnest money. The fact that he, uh, we said yesterday, God has painted himself into a corner, hasn't he? If, if he fails to keep his promise, which we know he will never, but we get to keep God. And if he does keep his promise, and he know, we know he'll, he will keep his promise, we get to keep God. So either ways, we are winners in him. We are blessed. All right? So having said that, what I'd like to do is to direct our attention to the second part of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read from verse 15 onwards. 15 onwards. And if I can request you to please stand up as we read God's word. This is what... The children of Israel did when word was read by Ezra. So I'm going to ask you all to please rise to your feet. Verse 15. For this reason, because I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints... I do not cease to give thanks to you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great mind that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that, that even as we look at your word, it's your spirit who will help us understand. Uh, help me to s- stand aside, step aside. Uh, my frailties, my weakness, Lord, would not be the one that will show up, but you would be magnified. Your son would be glorified. Thank you again for all that you mean to us and for loving us so much. In Jesus Christ, our Lord's name. Please be seated. Right, our key verse for today is that first verse that we read in verse 15. I've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love for all your saints. I want you to grab that. I want you to understand that. Faith in Christ Jesus and love for all your saints. Faith and love. Your faith, your love. I want us to zone in on that and help us understand what that means and what, what that would mean for, for you at, at your station in life, all right? Um, I was um, <clears throat> traveling from Detroit to Toronto, and the guy sitting next to me was this guy from Notre Dame, and a uh, big, huge guy, and I started talking to him. We shook hands. His hand was all calloused and all of that, and I was like, uh, like what, are you, what are you doing? Why are you coming to Toronto? And um, I, asked, I actually asked him, are you already running away from the U.S.? But, you know, that was a private joke. <laughs> uh, so he says, no, he's actually coming in for an NHL draft. I said, wow. Uh, and, you know, he started to say about how he was practicing and all of that. And he's coming so that when the, uh, you know, they would come and watch him play, that they can choose him, that they would be drafted. And I was saying, listen, I'm actually going to be speaking about Ephesians. And there it tells me I didn't have to play. I get chosen before the play. Are you excited? Right. We are. Right? We, we are drafted into God's kingdom, God's family, into his household. All right? So uh, all to his praise, uh, we saw that. But coming back to this principle, your faith, your love, I want, to, I want us to know that this is a principle that for Christians, you see, sometimes we, we think that <clears throat> as Christians, we, uh, it's an individual, it's a personal faith, right? I mean, I come to the Lord Jesus Christ, I say, Lord, you are, you are God, you are Lord, I confess my sin, and we tend to keep our faith personal. That is what the society is telling us. 
keep your faith personal. Right? And we are saying my faith is, is personal. It's my identity. I cannot keep it hidden. It is personal. But the fact is, when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment, what did he say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, and love your neighbor, for in those two, the whole law hangs. Love for God, love for the saints. All right, Colossians 1, 4. Since we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of our love that you have for all the saints, love for all the saints and love for God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love. I just love the term because it's not easy to love and, and the Bible recognizes that and he calls it what? Did you get that? Did you grab that? the labor of love. It's called the labor of love. It's labor. It's not easy. You need to sweat over it. Okay? But um, the fact of the matter is this. We cannot say we love the Lord and hate His bride. And I want to, us to start thinking about this because many times we come to church, start thinking about ourselves. Right? What am I getting out of church? But church is not about us. It's about God. It's not we don't get a church that we can get, but we can give, all right? So that, that is what we, we need to uh, redefine in our mind. And so when we read Ephesians, actually, it brings about three relationships between Christ and the church and the Christian. So I want to urge, when you get back, I want you to read the book of Ephesians, all right? Read it in different translations, different versions, and it's just the most beautiful episode. And you get these three relationships between church, uh, between Christ, church, and the Christian. Now I'm saying to you this, when you have three people, there are four types of relationships possible. One is that you can be in him, that you can be in, the, in Christ, but not in the church. And when I say church, it's the local church, right? Because uh, you can say that, uh, well, I'm part of the universal church, but that's being in Christ. Uh, but the manifestation of that church is always in the local church. So, uh, you know, I'm, I, when I use the word church, I'm talking about the local church. So the first one is you can be in him, but not be part of a local church, right? The second one is you can be part of a local church, but you're not part of the church, part of Christ. Or third is you could be not part of Christ, nor part of the local church. You tracking with me? And the fourth one is you are both in Christ and as part of a local church. And Ephesians is about the last one, right? If you are part of the local church, you're coming for all the activities and all that, and, you know, everything, everybody looks at you and says, wow, you sing well, or you, you know, I don't know what you do, but, um, but you're fooling yourself if you're not part of Christ. We get that. But I want to talk to us about this last one. And I'm praying that you are in Christ. And we will, you know, uh, as we uh, question ourselves, as we go, go through this, uh, hopefully that becomes clear in our minds that we are both in him and actively involved in the local church. I'm trying to understand how that means and what that looks for us, okay? But, um, and the reason why I want to bring this up is the fact that this concept of local church, this involvement in the local church is kind of forgotten. Uh, there was this article that spoke about two kinds of people, the nuns and the duns. Have you heard of that? The nuns. You know, if, if, um, if there are, uh, there's an application blank that needs to be written out, they would write uh, against religious affiliation, affiliation, they would write none. They don't, they don't belong to any religion. They would write none. But there are a lot of people who now, don't, they don't write it, they call themselves, they're done. D-O-N-E. Done. They're done with church. But they're do not done with Christ. They want to hold on to the, uh, the benefits of being in Christ, but not necessarily be part of a local church. 
and I, I want to also direct my attention to those of you who may be considering saying that church, I'm done with church. You know, I've, I've tried to, I've tried to uh, understand, I, you know, but I am not getting it. I, I'm, I'm done with church. No, I want to speak to you about that because this book, Paul is writing essentially uh, trying to tell you about the greatness, the goodness, the wonder of this mystery that he talks about the church. Okay, so the reason I bring this up is um, I, I get a sense that many of us are struggling about our identity, our role in the local church. And I want to remind us afresh that where God has placed us is the place where he wants you to be in this station of life without making your own demands on God about where you want to be. Okay, the, the uh, God is not done with church. God is not done with church. As you read the book of Ephesians, that becomes clear. And so you cannot be done with church. All right? So coming back to this verse, that was my lecture. All right? Okay. So uh, coming back to this uh, verse, what are the two things we said we identified? What are those two things? Faith and love. Yeah, your faith, your love. Your faith, can you tell that? Uh, just say it out loud. Can it? <laughs> your faith, your love. A little louder. Thank you, thank you. Your faith, your love. I want us to understand that these are the two things we're talking about, right? I believe in some sense that that's the missing ingredient. The reason we have a problem is because either of these two ingredients are missing. I'm not sure if there's anybody here who bakes, right? And you start to bake and you, f and you find that like the major ingredient is missing. You go ahead and bake it or you don't, or you, what do you do? What would you do? Any bakers here? Any guys, any people who bake rather? No, nobody wants to put there. Yeah, okay, tell me, would you go ahead? I bake cookies. You bake cookies. Now let's say there's no flour. What are you gonna do? Uh, I don't know. You don't know, yeah, that's right. I don't know too, all right? Because these are the essential ingredients that Paul is saying uh, that we need to have as a Christian life, all right? So let's just talk about the the faith, because why is that faith necessary? As I was reading Ephesians, it became apparent to me, faith is necessary because it leads to the fullness of God. The fullness of God. I'll give you a verse very shortly, but tell me about fullness of God. Where else do we read about the fullness of God? Christ. Christ. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, I believe it is, for uh, it pleased the Father that the fullness of deity would d dwell uh, in, in him. The fullness of deity would dwell in him. That's Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. What is the last verse we read today? Verse 23, chapter 1, verse 23. It talks about the fullness. And what, whose fullness or what fullness do we read there? Look at your verse, 23, 23. Where do we get that? Which is his body, the fullness of him, that fills all in all. That church would be the fullness of Christ. Okay? And then you get to chapter 3, verse 19. Chapter 3, verse 19. Can somebody read that? Somebody read chapter 3, verse 19. that ye may be filled with the fullness of God. That's the prayer of Paul to Ephesians, and my prayer to you, that you would be filled with the fullness of God. God is saying Christ is the fullness of the deity. In chapter 1, we see church is the fullness of God, and how church makes visible, ch church glorifies Christ. That's the, you know, the body is the one that makes the, the, uh, the person visible, the church. And then now we see Christian, hey, listen, that you will be filled with the fullness of God. This, I believe, is the abundant life that the Lord Jesus Christ talks about earlier, that the fullness of God, I'm telling you, if you're going to be gripped by the fullness of God, you will not ever think that, hey, I, I, I'm done with church or I'm done with this faith. 
You know something? Think, of, think about it this way, right? I mean, you guys started at 7.30, but I come rolling in at 8 o'clock, and I say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm so sorry, but I got hit by a Mack truck on the way in. I, I, you know, I, I was coming in, I got hit by this Mack truck, and the Mack truck just went right over my car. It was just like flattened out, like Tom and Jerry cartoon. I'm not sure if you, I'm dating myself when I say that, but uh, just flattened myself out. But you know what I did? I got up, I peeled myself, peeled my car off the tarmac, and I just patted it up, made it back into a car, got into the car, and I came running here. I got delayed, I'm sorry. And you look at me and you'd say, what? Why? Because if I'm hit by a Mack truck, the shape of my face would change. We have that expression in India, do we not? If a truck hits me, this is not how I'm going to look. And how dare we say that when we see the Almighty God, when we meet the Almighty God, when we interact, when, we, when we've had an interaction with Him, that we can be the same. You're fooling yourself. You're fooling yourself. Because... Um, if you think you, you can have fun on both sides, it doesn't work that way. God's not going to be fooled. You're only having fun on this side of the world. Because your life must be transformed. The fullness of God. That's what he wants of us. All right? The fullness of God it becomes evident. When little Zoe comes, comes home, we... Um, we play hide and seek. Now Zoe is about two and a half years old. We play hide and seek. And she says, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play hide and seek. And she goes and, and she puts her head under the pillow and she thinks she's hiding, all right? And so we play this game, hey, Zoe, where are you? Where are you? And, and I can hear this giggle and all of that, but her head is still under the pillow or the cushion or whatever that be. But we know where she is, right? We can see her body. It's a very, I hope you understand, it, it, it's not, you know, this illustration is this, that, that in this, in somehow the head is hit and the world is not able to see Christ. And it's the body, the Lord Jesus, the church is made visible through the body. So you have a role, dear brothers and sisters, as we look at the fullness of God, the role that we have. Um, in, in making a Christ known, making a Christ known. When I, um, about three years ago, about four years this year, uh, the Lord called me in a full-time work. And I got in kicking and screaming, no credit to me to be in full-time work. I mean, I was put in a bind uh, at almost at gunpoint. I came to full-time service. But I'm thankful to God that he didn't let go. He didn't let go. His grace gripped me. Looking back, I'm so thankful that he did that. But when I got into full-time work, uh, people would start to say, hey, you're on the highest calling. I think that is, that is wrong doctrine. Uh, 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 it's heretical to an extent, to, you know, at worst. Because where God wants us to be, to do what he wants you to do, whether it be in school, whether it be in college, university, work, or whatever it is that you do, to be and to do where God is asking you to be so that he can be made visible. That's your highest calling. You tracking with me on that? So it is not me, it is not someone else. We always want to see, you know, identify pockets of people who are doing somehow the greater things, but we think that that's, that's, the, that's something that I need to do. And God is saying, hey, listen, no, no, no. When you live this life, this abundant life, this fullness of life, when God grips you, takes control of you in such a way that your life is transformed, you glorify the God in heaven, when in, in Matthew 5, it says that, right? When, when the others see your good works, that they would glorify your Father in heaven. That is what I hope would happen. I, 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 
I, uh, I, I don't know if I'm out, of, out, on, out on a limb when I say this, but I know all of us here, or most of us here, is what we'd consider the coconut generation, right? Brown on the outside, white on the inside. Or the potato, or whatever you want to call it, brown on the outside, white on the inside. And we all struggle with the identity. We, because at home, there's a culture, and outside of, there's another culture. At church, you go, there's another culture. And you struggle. And you struggle. And you're wondering, like, how do I fit into this? And I want us to know that God is not stumped by your culture shock. He knows exactly, before, he, before the foundations of the world were laid, he knew about you. And, and so when he gives you an identity, I, I rest my case in him. I'm thankful that I am where I am. I don't need to be anyone else. I don't need to be talking uh, Brexit about church. Right? Okay, some of you are smiling and others are not. I don't know. Am I talking or what? Yeah. I want us to know this, right? I really want us to think. I want us to think that where God has placed us is really important. I, the, so that's faith. And then there's also this love. This love, this, this, this thing called agape love. A ch- Ephesians gives church in three different pictures. Do you know what they are? I mean, have you done Ephesians in, in your youth group? It gives you three pictures. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, if, g- talk about it. Like, what are some of the pictures that we have about the church in Ephesians? One is the body. Okay, we spoke about the body. Can you say body? A little louder. Body. All right, you got body. All right, what's the second one? In chapter 3, building. We got building. Okay, all right, your turn again. Building, building. all right. And chapter 5 is bride. bride. So you got body, body. Building. building, bride. Okay, so you see, it's because of the limitation of the language that... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is giving you these three imageries. Um, I've always wondered, how is this body a building and a bride? And like I'm trying to put all that three together and uh, just messes up. But, 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 the, but this is what it is, right? That we are, a, if you're a body, we are members one of the other. But if you're a building, we are a construction site. Construction site means it's going to be messy. There's going to be dust. There's going to be, um, you know, I don't know, uh, hazards. And you tripped over some and you're saying like, what, this is church? Yeah, this is church. Because we're being built. And once we're built, we'll be presented perfect. That's great. But right now, this, uh, uh, you know, sometimes you go to these malls, you find the sign. What does the sign say? Excuse our mess, we are, we are renovating or we're building or whatever, construction site, whatever it is. And I want you to understand the church is exactly that. You're being built, right? I hope you can say that your life today is much built up in Christ than it was last year. I wanted to say yesterday. Uh, hopefully, we've had some growth since yesterday, but at least since last year. If you haven't had that growth, if you haven't moved, if you, if you feel like you're just in a rut, now get on your knees and, you know, get to God. Because you, you better be part of that construction uh, project. All right? So, what I liked best is Matthew 18. What is Matthew 18 about? Do you, do you know what I'm talking about, Matthew 18? What do you read about in Matthew 18? About? I can't hear you, sorry. Oh, fights and disagreements, all right. But it's about the church, all right. <laughs> it's, 
it's really funny that church would be known uh, by that, but hey, no, God is working. <laughs> God is working. It's about discipline, but it's about the church. But what I like about that chapter is it's in the same chapter, there's this parable of the, ten, the, the person who is forgiven the 10,000 talents and he gets out and he finds somebody who owes him 100 denarii and he chokes his uh, throat and he's like, throws him into the prison and says, you better pay up. Otherwise, uh, you know, I'm not going to let you go. And then um, the king gets to hear about it and you know, he's the one who is put behind the prison. You see what's happening there? You see, we have experienced agape love. We have experienced this love that this world can never show us. If we have the template of what agape love is all about, we better be showing it to these people in church. Before we can go to evangelize others, our souls are, you know, we are so excited. We want to die for people who are dying without Christ, but we are unable to love those in the church. And I think there's something wrong. Amen? Oh, we are brethren. <laughs> Do you agree? We are broken, we are forgiven, but we are taught to love by the God, by God who is love. Nobody in, the, in this world, apart from those in Christ, are able to show, you know, people say God is love. You ask them, where did you get this concept from? Where, which religion tells you God is love? Except Christ. Nowhere else. And so if we have experienced forgiveness to such extent, dare we hold back some little inconveniences that we would love, we would love. The, the cement that holds us together is this agape love. It was 1961. The Green Bay Packers have just lost their, uh, their you know, the cup. They, they gave up a, a, a lead in the last quarter. And in the off season, they were just struggling. They were just devastated that they had lost after having come you know, to, to the, the World Cup is what they lost, but having come to the last point that they lost. And so the, the training season has just begun, and so they march in, about 38 of them, they march in, and they now want to talk about, you know, strategies and things that they can do to take the game to the next level. But their coach, Vince Lombardi, he holds up a, the pigskin and he says, gentlemen, this is football. He starts them off with the basic. He starts to say, listen, I understand you guys are like the pro professional football players, but I want you to understand this is football. And this is what Paul is doing. He holds up the church and says, this is love. Evidenced for the world to see. And dare we not love our saints. Dare we not love our saints. And Jesus says in John 13, 35, by this you shall know that all men shall know you are my disciples when you do what? No, when you sing. Do what? Do what? I can't hear you. Love one another. Let's not, you know, you know when, when there is an issue, that, and if we have problem dealing with people, if you feel I can't love somebody, that's the beginning of sin in your life. I want to tell you that as I say that to myself. But I'm thankful that it's Christ who's building. Christ is building. Even though it's messy, he is building the greatest cathedral the world has ever known. And in fact, when you read chapter 3, I think it's 18, it says the manifold riches of God, 
you know, so that, so that the rulers in heavenly places, the rulers and authorities in heavenly places are going to go, wow. Not just people in this world. That's what Christ is building. And I want to be part of that. What about you guys? You want to be? You don't want to be, okay. Yeah. You want to be, right? This is the king of the universe. Who is my savior? Who is my Lord? You know, I really think... uh, is there any Raptors fans out here? Oh, okay, not too loud. A little louder. Come on, Raptors, come on. I don't know what fans you are, but I want to... Are you not Raptors? No? <laughs> okay, Toronto. Where's Toronto here? Okay, all right, good. Hey, good. Thank you, thank you. All right, so let's assume whatever your, your uh, sports team is, right? And so let's say you got this... Tickets. You got two tickets to, to the court side, whatever you call that, right in the front. They're giving it to you. And you say, hey, no, man, I'm going to watch it on my old laptop and I'll stream it. And that's what we tend to do. Like, we are, we, we are missing the greatest show that's happening. It's not a Raptors game. This is far beyond that. I want us to understand from God's word. Not through our eyes with the things that we see. Because we see messy things. Because our eyes are messed up. We are messed up. You, you know, oh, I was wondering why you guys all look all smudgy. You know why? Because it's not, but I'm just trying to <laughs> make a point. The moment I have glasses which are all smudged up, I don't get to see the world right. We see through a glass dimly. I mean, I misquote that, but I hope you understand that. I'm just a little um, crazy, I guess. And I don't know if there's anybody here who's even considering saying that I'm done with church. You know, like, I don't know why church, and I'm just going because my parents want that. I really thought about it, and I think that we should announce a national Nookie Day for people who don't want to go to church. You know, do a noogie on them. Um, get, wake up. You don't think it's funny, right? Okay, all right. That was just me. I, I, I thought about it. I really thought that's a good way to get people to church. But no, the Lord doesn't think that way, thankfully. But hey, man, get, I want you to know this is the work of God. This is the work of God. I want to leave you with three principles. I've been talking, I, you know, oh, there it is. Um, I don't know how much time I have, but let me give you three quick principles. But I want to tell you something that gripped my heart, all right? The three quick principles. One is, my life must reflect the Lordship of Christ. My, my life must reflect the Lordship of Christ. That's important. I, he must be Lord. Let me read to you a quote by Alan Hirsch. He says, Jesus is not a nice guy. He is Lord. He is not a nice guy speaking. He is Lord. Discipleship is learning and living that Jesus is Lord. He is the founder. He has defining rights. You take the words of Jesus seriously and that this is not a nice guy speaking. He is Lord. And we made him just into a decency cop. He is not that at all. We made the Lord into a religious God, which we do, what we do is slowly and surely take him out of every other sphere until he becomes just a religious God. God has no relevance to any other aspect, economic or political aspects of our life or any other. What he is saying is we've learned to keep this divide between the secular and the sacred. There is a life that I live on a Sunday and there's a life that I live on the weekday. This, this divide the secular and the sacred, there's nothing, there's no divide. He cannot have a divide. Everything needs to be sacred if he is Lord. Otherwise, you're the Lord. And you're made in, into a religious God. And second, my faith must demonstrate love. My faith must demonstrate love. You've been thinking that, hey, you've been thinking, you want to just quit church? 
Like, if I'm walking around here and parts of my body just fall off, you would think that's pretty freaky. <coughs> and we think that's all right. But faith must demonstrate love. I read this Facebook post. Say, I invited Jesus into my heart and he came in with all his friends and I didn't quite like that. <laughs> he does, doesn't he? He comes with his disciples. I don't know if the, if the wine ran out because the disciples were having too much wine. I don't know. <laughs> like, oh, 12 more people? Okay. <laughs> no, they were not 12 at that time, but I'm talking about John, uh, John 2. <laughs> Play with me, guys. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. And thirdly, we said, labor is love. My labor must reflect my commitment. I want you to, um, <clears throat> you know, there is this gentleman called David Sitton who runs a ministry called Every Tribe Ministry. His mentor was Joe Cannon. And he tells his story, his testimony of how David Sitton came to know Christ and how Joe Cannon invested into his life. And Joe Cannon was a missionary in Papua New Guinea. And Joe Cannon came up to him and says, listen, I came up to David Sitton and says, hey, listen, I want you to come on a mission trip to Papua New Guinea. So uh, David says, all right. And then he gets his uh, backpack. He lands in Papua New Guinea, but Joe, Joe Cannon is nowhere to be found. He's out there in the woods tr- reaching the gospel to the tribes. And he waits three days. And after three days is w- when he wants to have this orientation as to what this mission is going to be all about. And before everything starts, he slips this form in front of him, and right there is written, burial form. And so David Sitton says, what? What is this? You want me to sign a burial form? He says, yeah, of course, because when we get out into that woods, if you die, I'm not going to haul you back. No way. And if I die, I don't want you to haul me back, but I want you to march on because I want you to count the cost and pay the cost because Jesus is worth it. Is he worth it to you? Is he? At least nod your head. He's precious, isn't he? He's precious. I, um, I want to talk just briefly about those who may have some kind of a ministry. Maybe a Sunday school ministry. Maybe a youth ministry. Maybe, you know, I don't know. Maybe your older brother, older sister, and you want to see your younger brother, younger sister know the Lord a little more. And that's a ministry. Whatever your ministry, and you, you're like, ah, oh, I'm doing so much, but, you know, these people are not listening to me. I want to encourage you. I'm not sure if you know of, of Edward Kimball. How many of you have heard of that name, Edward Kimball? No, you, you're raising your hand or just? Okay. All right. Edward Kimball, right? So nobody knows Edward Kimball. But Edward Kimball was a Sunday school teacher who unleashed D.L. Moody into the world. He was just a Sunday school teacher. Nobody here knows his name, probably not in many parts of the world. But heaven rings with his name because because of him, D.L. Moody was able to bring many to the Lord. And I want to therefore encourage you, your work might look small and, and, and laborious. It's a labor. But keep at it, brothers and sisters. Be faithful. That, that's the faithfulness that we're talking about. Faithfulness is work, as labor. Don't give up, because God's not giving up on you. God's not giving up on the other person. And so what I'm going to do before I pray is I'm going to ask those uh, brothers and sisters who I had said would be the ones who you can look to, if they can come right up here in the front, Uh, so that you can see who they are, and uh, then I'll talk about what will happen. So if you can just step step up, that'd be great. Right. Uh, Do you mind just telling your name so that they can hear you? Jonathan. Jonathan. 
Jubin, Jeswin, Loris, JB, JB Sunaina, Sunaina Jerry. Jerry. All right. The reason I bring them up here is that I pray and I hope that if there's somebody here who feels like I need to talk to somebody, you know, nobody seems to understand me. And if that is true, I want you to look them up during the rest of the conference. Take their emails or, or phone numbers or whatever. Uh, don't call them at odd hours, but, you know, like, I've got to talk to you at 1 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> right? But, but listen, listen, I want to tell you that we want to be there. Like my prayer is, I want to see you all in heaven. And so please, don't brush aside any, any doubts that you might have, any urgent needs, thoughts, something's disturbing you. I don't know what it is that you would seek them out, talk to, talk to them. Uh, because if you come to me, I'm going to hit you on your head. No. I love you guys. I love you guys. I want, to, I want you to know. We've been praying for you, okay? I want you to know that, that we've seen too many young people walk away from faith. We don't want that to happen again. We don't want to happen. We don't want that to happen to you guys. You might think that you were raised in an assembly, in a good church, in a good home. But your life matters. And it's important that you take this seriously. All right? Let me just pray with you. Would you just stand up, please? Father God, we, we thank you for your son. Thank you, Lord, over these two days as we were thinking what we have received in your son. It's just mind-blowing. Many times we forget the uh, trials, our, the, the storms that we face uh, seems to loom larger than life, and we seem to f- f- find ourselves sinking. And those are the times, Lord, we pray that we we'll realize that you are by us and You're with us. You care for us. We're not in any kind of sin that you cannot uh, call us back out of. We are not so far gone. Our parents don't understand us. Our elders don't understand us. But we are thankful that our salvation is because of what your son has done on the cross. And through this pain, through these trials, through challenges, whatever it be, Lord, that this experience that you're taking us through... We, you would show your son to a greater glory in our lives and that our lives would be poured out as a result, that we would not be selfish. We would not be just about ourselves, not just, not just so caught up just about ourselves, but, Lord, that we would look ahead and look out and see there's so many who need help and are struggling likewise, and that we come alongside like the body, like a church, that we would be loving, that we would show this kind of love, that when the others see it, they would say, like, what is that? That is love that's out of the world, and it sure is that we be there for each other. And that, Lord, that you would grant us this prayer, that we would be able to see all of us, Lord, gather around the throne to praise your name, to glorify your name. For that's the greatest joy. For that's the purpose for which you've made us. And so we thank you for all the heads that are about. We ask this in your name and for your glory. Amen.